Okay, we are now streaming on Facebook Live after three minutes of hiccups, but we made it work. Welcome everybody. I am State Representative Lindsay LaPointe of the 19th House District, and I cover much of the far northwest side of Chicago, including Jefferson Park, Portage Park, Dunning, Gladstone Park, and some of the suburbs. And thank you for joining us tonight. Um, because tonight is the last night of March, our work, our our month honoring Social Work Month. Um, we decided uh, to pull together an event about social work and what it means to us. So we're going to have a, a conversation with two wonderful people that live right here in the 19th district in Jefferson Park and Portage Park that work in the field of social work. And I myself um, worked in the field of social work for nine years, and it absolutely informs who I am as a person and how I approach my work as a state representative. Um, just as a little background, one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this event is because most people, when you say the word social work, they they get a feeling and they, they know sort of what it is and they recognize that term. Um, but the more I talk to people, the more I'm convinced that many people think that social work is just about being a school counselor or maybe working in the child welfare system. And really social work can mean so many things. You can have so many different kinds of jobs um, in the field of social work. You can work in early childhood, you can work in violence reduction, you can work with veterans, um, with seniors. I meet people all the time in the up here on the far Northwest side who do various things in the field. So this conversation is about pulling back that curtain and finding out all the different things you can do and what, what a social work approach means. Um, so we will probably be on for about 45 minutes and just for a little rundown, we are each going to introduce ourselves, the three of us here on this panel and talk a little bit about what social work means to us um, we are going to each provide a little snapshot of what our journey has been in the field and the various roles that we have had, which will really show the depth, I think, of what social work can be. We're going to ask each other some questions. Um, and then we definitely want to touch on where, what, what would be the next steps of somebody who's interested in this field? Because um, I meet people a lot who certainly want, they want to pursue social work because most people have very positive feelings about it. So we're going to touch on all those things. And we'll start with the self intros and what social work means. And I am just going to start by kicking it over to Kelly Carroll to start there. Thank you. So hi, um, everyone. My name is Kelly Carroll. I am a licensed clinical social worker and I live in Portage Park. Um, and I'm really excited to be here talking about social work month. I, I very much I feel like being a social worker is part of my identity. I've worked with a lot of um, other mental health professionals um, in the past, and, and I've always felt a, a special um, sense of unique identity as a social worker, even though I've worked with a lot of helping professions in an interdisciplinary fashion. And I think part of that um, is, I think, has a lot to do with uh, we have this very um, like specific code of ethics that talks so much about what we value and valuing things like the dignity and worth of, of human beings, valuing social justice, valuing making change that's that's for the good of others. Um, and I think being so value driven as a profession is part of what um, makes me really excited about being a social worker. So even as I've thought about continuing um, my education, I, the, the idea of pursuing continued studies in social work as opposed to something like um, psychology or public health has always been really important to me because the identity piece is, is so important. Loud and clear, we do have some deep social work values going on. Amanda, tell us about what social work means to you. 
Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for this invitation. And Kelly, thank you so much for sharing parts of your journey and yourself. And so I'm coming to you as a second generation Taiwanese American raised with economic privilege, um, a proud Jefferson Park residence, um, mother of a pit bull who you might hear during this time and caretaker of two brilliant girls um, that is that are my partner's daughters. And so um, and also I go by pronoun she hers and so Lindsay I at this point in my life social work doesn't completely encompass I think my personal and professional identity but it's absolutely a crucial pillar it's what we call in early childhood a secure base and that I'm finding that I constantly return to it over and over and over again because it provides two really critical sets of questions one is both how am I thinking how am I analyzing and the second set of questions being how am I how am I to myself and how am I to others and who am I to myself and who am I to others and so um, I've really just deeply appreciated the ways that social work continues to ground me in both um, myself, but also who I am in relationship to and ultimately what is my work advancing. That is, that's awesome. And I, what I really appreciated about what, what you both shared is that even though social work is your, at least at this moment in time, it's it's what you do for work. Um, you you manage to share kind of what you think about social work and how that informs your approach, without even mentioning, like what you do for your paid job right now, which I think is is really cool because we're not we're as humans we're not defined completely, of course, by like what we do out there um, for our for our work. Um, I, I really like reflecting on social work. Um, so what, what it means to me, what social work means to me is it's all about helping people or clients is a word that we use a lot in the helping professions, figure out what, what those barriers are that are, um, stopping people from living the life that they want to live or and and when I say clients um, it can mean a person it can mean a family it can also mean a neighborhood or a whole community and and in my case in a state representative role it certainly does it means a whole bunch of communities so so what what kind of barriers are in, in the way of the people of the 19th house district or even everyone in Illinois kind of leading the, the life that they want to live. Um, the thing about social work and what it means to me that I think is different from a lot of It looks like we're having some technical difficulties and um, Lindsay will probably pop right back on. I'm wondering, um, as we wait for Lindsay to rejoin, um, Kelly, would you be open to sharing more about what your day-to-day -day is and what led you to that place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, uh, gosh, I feel like um, it might be helpful to kind of talk about the path that I've I've gotten on to get where I am. Um, so currently, um, I work in, in I guess you could call it violence intervention. I work for an organization called Chicago Cred, um, and we uh, do a lot of street outreach. Um, 
a, specifically targeting those that are at the most at risk of um, being involved in gun violence. Um, and as it turns out, those that are the most at risk of being shot are actually the most engaged in doing the shooting. Um, and so the people that we're working with, um, high, high risk factor, but we know that if we can target them and, and help them to have other opportunities um, that they may not be having um, without intervention um, because of a lot of the, um, I guess, lack of opportunity in the neighborhoods that they live in um, and some of the circumstances in their lives, um, we know that if we can change some of those things, those circumstances, and provide them with some skills and opportunities, that the violence will go down. Um, and so um, I have always wanted to work with the criminal justice population. Um, and so the I didn't get there directly, though. I actually um, started out, um, I think the thing that made me fall in love with social work without even realizing that's what was happening, um, I it was back in college and I, I took a, a trip to a federal prison and um, I ended up through some connections there, getting a job at the Department of Corrections in Wisconsin um, and met some really amazing mentors. Um, and they gave me this opportunity to go to some prisons and to talk to some inmates. And I just was so interested in the stories that I heard. Um, Lindsay's back on, wanna pop in with Lindsay. We were just kind of sharing a little bit of our story. Should I keep going here? Keep going, yeah. My, okay. I think my internet went out. Okay, well, we're glad you made it back on. Um, so I was so interested in the stories I was hearing and just the, um, I think the the human side of um, the experience of, of being in prison and, and that's something you don't hear about or get to learn a lot. Um, and I, at the time, um, had always been really driven by a sense of justice. I was like pre-law in school um, and thought I wanted to be an attorney. And at that point decided, well, maybe I could do a dual degree in law and social work. Um, there seemed to be a lot of power in that, that I could do sort of this, this human aspect, get to know people and their stories, but also advocate for them. Um, and for this sense of justice that I felt like was missing in a lot of areas. Um, and as it turned out, life had other plans. I didn't get into law school, um, but I did get into social work school um, and it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. I honestly don't think I'd be a very good attorney. I think it would have been miserable um, as I've come to know myself more and get into the field. Uh, it's, it's turned out to be a real blessing. Um, and so I went to Los Angeles, I got a master's degree in social work, um, and I began working with um, military veterans who um, had just come out of jail and prison. Um, and I come from a military family, so it ended, ended up being a really good fit with the population that I wanted to work with, criminal justice, but also some personal experience that I had. Um, and through that, I kind of got connected with the veterans community. Um, and my very first job was administrative. I always thought I, I did, I never thought I wanted to do clinical work. Um, my very first job was administrative and, and running a transitional housing program for veterans coming out of jail and prison. So dealing with homelessness, dealing with substance use, dealing with the criminal justice population, a lot of things, uh, dealing with veterans and reentry and readjustment issues, a lot of things all kind of at once, very niche population, if you will. Um, and uh, I, I got burnt out really quick. Um, I realized very early in this job that, gosh, I loved the work, but I felt like I didn't quite have some of the skill sets that I needed to do it as well as I wanted to. And I saw the importance of it, but I was like, I, I'm missing something. So I decided to pivot a little bit and get more clinical experience and more direct practice experience, what we call direct practice is really just working one-on-one -on -one with people um, rather than having more of like a big picture administrative or management role. Um, and I ended up working at the VA hospital doing inpatient medicine. And from there, I ended up transitioning into doing outpatient uh, psychotherapy with people who'd experienced trauma, whether it be combat trauma, sexual trauma in the military. Um, and what I learned from that is that trauma is connected. Um, the trauma begets trauma. Uh, and I ended up, um, you know, kind of getting really knee deep in this field of treating survivors of trauma within the veterans community. 
Um, I ended up at Rush University Medical Center working in the Road Home program um, and got amazing training um, and was able to, I think, learn some really cool interventions and impact people's lives in really powerful ways on that micro level. Um, I got an opportunity to be exposed to research in the field. I got the opportunity um, to, to do some education for up and coming social workers. Um, and everything I got exposed to was new and different and just made me more excited about it, but made me see so many directions I could go in in the field. And so I kind of got to a point after I became a mom a few years ago that uh, I knew I needed to make a change for a number of reasons. And as I was starting to think about where do I want to go, I've been exposed to lots of different areas in social work. So much of it is exciting. I loved everything that I did, but my heart was still calling me back to that criminal justice population where I started. And so while I spent a lot of time working with the veterans community and there's a lot of good work that can be done there. Actually, I don't know if people know this, the VA is like the number one employer of social workers in the country. Um, wow. Yeah, so uh, th that's why you tend to find a lot of social workers within the VA and they do a lot of re really great work. Um, but I, I just found that I needed to go back to my roots um, and what drew me into the field. And so this opportunity came up with Chicago Cred where I was able to, um, I know that there's a ton of trauma in uh, the lives of those who experience gun violence and who live in violence ridden parts of the city. And it's, it's such an epidemic um, that affects our community. And when it's something that's in your backyard, I think it's hard to not wanna do something about it. Um, so when an opportunity comes up, it's, it's it just, it was something I really couldn't say no to. And what's great about my current role is that I've been able to take my past training and experience with trauma. And now um, I do a lot of training to non-clinicians in how do you use those clinical interventions that most people who know how to do it have master's degrees, but you don't really need a master's degree to do it. And there's really good work you can do if you just get good training. Um, so being able to offer all of the experience take all the experience I've had and offer that back to communities that are really hurting and really honestly doing a lot of great work, but maybe just need a few more tools. It feels really amazing to offer those tools to them. Um, and, not, and I think another piece of, of what's been great about the work I'm doing now is that I'm again, learning so much. Again, with every move I make, there's, there's so much more to learn and it feels endless. Um, so there's a part of me that still has a million things I wanna do in the field. Um, I'll probably make a bunch more job changes in the future, um, but it's exciting to know that like the opportunity is there, but I'm still using that core background as a social worker of how am I serving people that are in need using the skill sets that I've accumulated over time. Wow, and you're, do you feel like you are, learning every day still now? Absolutely. Um, and I think that's part of how I approach the work I do. I do a ton of training in my current role, um, but the way that I start every training is like, listen, we're all experts. You're an expert on yourself and your life and the work that you do day to day. I have some knowledge about some specific interventions I wanna share with you, but um, I really wanna learn from you too. Um, and, and I think that that's another thing that I like about social work is it sort of invites that sort of approach um, that when we work with clients, whether they be individuals or systems or communities, we really have to approach from uh, the perspective of tell me about yourself. I need to know you to know how I can best serve you because you know yourself. Um, and so if you're someone who loves to learn, I think that social work is such a great field because the opportunities are, um, are really endless. Totally. That is, that is so true. It's that value of self-determination in, to use a nerdy word, in the client system. If that's a person, if that's a family, if that's a whole neighborhood, um, self-determination is key. And if you're, if you're the type of person who needs to know the answer right away, social work probably isn't for you because it's, it's a, there's yeah. a lot of, questions that don't get answered. We do a lot of asking the questions and a lot of listening. 
Yeah, and I'm definitely one of those people that wants to know the answer right away. It's funny, probably one of the most famous social workers in the world is Brene Brown, and she talks about this in her like um, really popular TED Talk that, you know, she went into social work thinking like, life is messy, let's clean it up. And what she learned was, actually, life is messy, let's, let's sit in it. That's really the approach when you're a social worker. And I feel like I had a very similar experience of wanting to come in and dive in and make things neater. And what I've learned is that like, actually, you, you get a little bit more out of things when you sit in the mess and when you're open to sitting in the mess. Um, because maybe there's some beauty in there. And it's not so messy. It's just how it is. Mm -hmm. Amanda, did I miss you when I was off Facebook Live? Or have you shared your journey yet? I have not yet. And I've just been so enjoying this conversation. <laughs> Well, tell us about your journey in the field of social work. Sure. I um, just love how there's just so many natural points of convergence and also divergence um, already. And, um, you know, Kelly really sees so much of my pathway and yours. And also, like, we're in very different spheres of practice, which I love that um, there's that overlap and non overlap. And so, um, wh where to begin? I always loved problem solving since being a young child like puzzles and math problems and like just really love to just to sit and kind of pull things apart and think about how it works and how it can work better and so not surprisingly entered college as a civil engineering major and um really struggled I didn't struggle with the science per se, but really with the fact that we never talked about power unless it was in the context of mathematics or physics. And so I um, did some searching across campus and found the School of Social Work and really knew I was home when I was taking classes in critical race theory and program design and then in clinical classes that really taught me to think about who I am and what I bring to the practice and really inviting in parts of myself that I thought I could never bring in professionally ever and actually being told that like this is this is for the betterment of yourself and for your communities when you can show up fully to this work and just my mind was blown from that and so continued to fall in love with social work and um, started off in a much more clinical um approach in terms of work, did my practicum in a residential treatment center for um, young boys who are wards of the state, and then moved to Chicago and decided to pursue a master's in social work right after my bachelor's because I really just didn't feel ready to practice. Like I, I had so many curiosities and just didn't feel right to me to go straight into the field. And, um, but what I knew was that I wanted to work alongside communities and I wanted to manage and design programs. And so I um, went the administrative route, what it's called, but spent all my extra credits taking, oh, there we are. I love that. We welcome dogs. You know it's live when you get a little bit of dog marks in the path in the back. We have a very robust welcoming committee in this. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so um really um just was felt very passionately about using the clinical skills, um, but not in terms of, you know, what people typically think of the client as the person sitting across from me, but really what does it mean to bring those skills and approaches to working alongside people and building and scaling and designing programs um, for communities. And so um, in that time, I um, wrote, co-wrote um, with Lindsay a toolkit on um, how programs across Illinois are thinking about adult prison diversion programs. Um, I worked in Chicago Freedom School, uh, really uh, working alongside young people to design and implement uh, programming for young organizers of color here in Chicago and um, also provided clinical case management um, to adults with serious mental health conditions. And um, in this time was very much repoliticized in um, spaces and Kelly, similar to you, where really rethinking um, and confronting the very ugly things that 
have allowed our criminal legal system to grow in the way it has, right? That like, um, and through all these experiences, because I think criminalization is really something that you can't go through social work without thinking about that. How is it that white supremacy and other systems of violence and oppression have really produced people that are truly disposable to the point that we can put them in cages and expect that they come out and that they will be absolutely fine where they go back in, you know? And so um, brought those curiosities to actually violence prevention. And my first full-time job was as a data manager at um, Institute for Nonviolent Chicago. And that's actually one of the places that Kelly closely works with. So that's another kind of moment of convergence for us. And, um, and so uh, was really working alongside staff and thinking about what if we were to think about data as stories? What is the story we want to tell? Who gets to tell the story? Whose voices are amplified? Whose perspectives are amplified? And how do we think about data in that way instead? And I think that's a very social work perspective. Um, and you know, for for so for now, um, I work in philanthropy. I am um, scaling an initiative that provides DEI services to early childhood organizations across um, the nation, and also am a coach at the Chicago Asian. Oh, sorry, go ahead. DEI, you threw out an acronym. Yes. Thank you for the literacy is. moment. Yes, um, <laughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we're really supporting early childhood organizations and beginning with self-awareness to think about what does it mean to deepen our practice of equity and inclusion alongside the communities that we serve. Um, and so I think once again, like social work takes a little bit of a different iteration in every phase that I go through. And I think what social work has really provided me with in this stage of my life is the courage and the questions to think about like, what are the legacies that I carry because of my professional orientation that philanthropy does not have money by accident, right? This is money that has been made off of um, stolen income and wages and ways that have been um that are not ethical and actually don't advance what we are trying to do so what does it mean to work in philanthropy as a social worker to know that it is actually my responsibility that i carry that legacy but i'm also have the responsibility to build a new legacy towards liberation and abundance and um and while undoing that legacy and that knowing that um you know, I'm not alone and that every part of the way, right, I am alongside other people. And that's also the social work part that like, that's how we maintain hope. And that's how we maintain our practice that um, we know that when we go alone for too long, that actually means that we're not on the right pathway. And so um, that's been really key in thinking and working with this core group of folks who are taking literally something that they thought of in a committee meeting and is now being scaled into a full nonprofit um, consulting firm. What you said about just philanthropy overall, um, it resonates with me because how, like how we choose to spend money and, and how we choose to budget is such a reflection of values. We kind of, we hear this buzzword a lot but it's it's a buzzword for a reason because it's true a, a budget is a moral document and obviously in my role now we i have there's a role that we all play if, if you're a lawmaker in, in making really important budgetary decisions um where where some entities have just been cut out and we've gotten way too comfortable with that and just as an example an issue that i'm working a lot on right now is the the horrendous lack of support that we give to our families children and adults that have developmental disabilities like it's really stunning the lack of support that we as a state provide and so i've just been thinking about that issue a lot lately and how um it, it's just so reflective of like what we choose to spend money on um is is really a statement on what we value in our fellow humans. So we have a long way to go in that department. I'm gonna share like a hyper snapshot of my social work journey because I don't wanna talk too much. Um, but what I, what I kind of often say, and I have to introduce myself to people a lot is that I, I often say I am a social worker turned 
policy professional turned state representative. And, and that is all true. Um, and they're very connected. Like the reason I went into bigger picture policy advocacy work is because of the nine years I spent on the ground working in various social work roles. And then the reason I wanted to say, yes, I wanna get into, an ele into elected office is because I came to this realization that who is in office and how they approach things and who they bring to the table just matters so much. Um, but when I think back, <laughs> And when I think back to really high school, I remember having this thought. And back then I had no, I, I, even though my mom was a social worker when I was a kid, I, I didn't really have a full grasp of what it was. And I didn't quite know, of course, like most of us don't, what we wanna do in life in high school. But I do, I have this very lucid memory of at some point in high school, probably near the, the latter end of it, I thought to myself, I don't really know exactly what I want to do, but I I really I want to help people figure out what a productive, meaningful life means to them. I don't know what that might be, but I want to help them figure it out. And then I want to help them get there and execute it. And it's so interesting to think back on me as like a 17-year-old thinking that way, because in many ways, like that's exactly. That's, that's exactly what social work is in many ways. Not telling anyone what to do, but helping them figure out what's gonna be the best life for you and then make a plan and, and get there. Um, so I ended up in undergrad studying sociology, which was pretty mind blowing because I, I came from a high school that only had the basics, like math, science, English. We didn't have psychology or sociology. So it was really, it really opened my mind to realize like there's a whole academic field all about studying humans and how they operate in groups and really studying what are what are what are the social issues or social problems is a word that we use a lot and what work can we do to to mend those social issues to and to heal people's pain and that was just amazing to realize oh there's a whole field related to this Right after college, I ended up working at a group home for kids with special needs. And that was incredibly meaningful work where I went to work every day and knew I'm really helping a family and a, and a child who's really struggling right now with things like depression and anxiety and acting out to the point where the young people were removed from their homes. Um, but my other big takeaway from that work is that, that the way we were going about helping families and young people, it, it didn't seem right. We, and I'm sure you'll, you'll all recognize this, we, we, we take kids out of their families and we put them in a group home with other kids who also are struggling. And we, historically, we, we treat the child well, the child's a part of a family system and a community system. And so if we only treat the child and then we, they eventually hopefully go back to the family or community, you're not, you're not really helping people get to those meaningful lives that, that I was thinking about in high school. Um, that's how I found the field of direct service social work. And um, my work that I did a little bit later in housing and homelessness, that was really my launching pad for want, wanting to get into bigger picture systemic and policy work because what I was seeing on the ground is if we say we wanna end homelessness, but we're nowhere near instituting the policies that will get us there. Um, and it's very connected to the work that, that you both are talking about too. Um, when, we, when we don't have a system that can support people that have mental health symptoms and struggles, and we, we layer stigma on top of that. Um, and maybe if they do have a job, um, and I was working in this field before we started raising the minimum wage, people are making eight twenty five an hour with, with the rents, what they are, there's just no way. Like, of course we're gonna have a, a large 
homeless population. So that was really my, my motivation to look into social work, get my master's in social work so I could give myself the toolbox I needed to really work on those bigger picture systemic policy issues. And the area that I ended up going into, which I'm very thankful for, is the field of creating a more rehabilitative criminal justice system. And just to, we'll kind of bring it back and ask each other some questions right now. Um, what I, I learned a lot and saw a lot in that work and I got to travel all around the state and help counties in Illinois set up alternatives to incarceration for people that would otherwise go to prison by providing supervision and services to help people actually change their behavior and get at the root cause of crime. And in the programs I was working with all around the state, the root cause of crime was unaddressed mental health issues, unaddressed substance abuse issues, unaddressed trauma issues, which the programs were mental health courts, drug courts, and guess what, veterans courts, which like goes back to, I'm sure a lot of the things you saw on the ground, Kelly, why do we have so many veterans that have mental health issues and has, have to access um, social workers in, in VA hospitals? And why do we have really high rates of veterans who are homeless? Well, it's because we don't address the, the root causes of, of the drug use um, and, and the mental health systems. And I, I met a lot of people all around the state who were so thankful to be in a mental health court and a drug court. And keep in mind, they've, there's been some crime committed that even gets them in the program. And it's usually possession of a controlled substance, um, sometimes retail theft. Um, people were generally really happy to be in the programs. And what I heard over and over, especially when it comes to substance use and drug courts is that people were actually never able to access drug treatment until they were in a drug court. And, and that in itself, for obvious reasons, is a, is a really huge systemic issue that we need to address. And I do feel like we, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act and many more people since 2012 in Cook County being able to access Medicaid, which is our health care for people who are low income. We are making a dent um, in access to care, but man, we have a long way to go. Um, so that's, a, we're not even going to get into my state rep role, but that's some of my social work background and, and what inspired me to get into the bigger picture work and want to make bigger picture change as a lawmaker. So I have a few questions, but you two might have questions that we could all ask each other for the next maybe five or so minutes too. You know, one of the things that was coming to mind for me in just, you know, hearing both of your journeys and sort of reflecting on my own is I, I think, I don't know that we've used this word explicitly, but one of the pieces that that comes up in in all of them and then i think is so key to social work is this idea of relationships of building relationships of helping people to learn to have them how to cultivate them and it, it may it may not just it may be a relationship with a with a client it may be relationships between humans relationships between systems um between individuals and systems um and i think that's one of the things that no matter what role i'm in uh, no matter what job I've had, even as I think about where I want to go in the future with my career, that's like this foundational piece is what what are the relationships at play and how am I using my skill set um, to make those relationships work, right? <laughs> Whether it's between people or systems. Um, and I'm curious uh, I, if that's something that resonates with you guys or like how you see that at play in in your work and in the unique roles that you have. Absolutely, I'll jump in first. Um, the strength of relationships 
is is foundational um, to almost all of my work. And I, two, two, all kind of two very different things come to mind. Um, when I was working in um, direct service social work, and a lot of my work was with people who were in homelessness, so arguably really rock bottom. Um, one of the threads that I experienced when when working in that area is um, a lot of people who end up at rock bottom in homelessness um, have struggled a lot with their own relationships. And, and for whatever reason, a lot of those relationships have turned into burned bridges. And, mm. and the folks I was working with didn't really have they needed help kind of building up their toolbox to repair those relationships, perhaps with their family, but also knowing how to build relationships up with, let's say the human service system so they could self-advocate to get what they needed. And so that's, that's where the social work approach comes in, helping people build back up those relationships and not, nav not taking over and doing the work for anyone, but helping them build their own toolbox so they can navigate the human service system on their own eventually. Um, and then in, in my state rep role, I mean, everything I do is about relationships and perhaps where it's most explicit is when people reach out to our district office, which they do all day and we love it. And right now, we'll have people reach out sometimes on in the legislative arena um, because they want to weigh in on a certain piece of legislation but also during the pandemic people are reaching out constantly for services and support from the state and we consider our office a soft landing pad for people in crisis whether you reach out to us for legislation or to seek support what we always try to do is like, we, we value that relationship. And, and even if somebody comes to us in anger, which they do because not everyone loves everything I do. And that's, that is, that is fine. Um, like we want to, we want to reinforce, like, we love it that you reach out, even if you're upset because in the role I'm in now, that's what democracy is all about, having a relationship with your elected official and feeling comfortable to reach out and either share your point of view or ask for what you need. Um, so we take that part of the job so seriously and it's all about building up relationships so we can have an open line of communication. I'll add a couple things. I love this question because I think that's truly the essence of social, social work, right? That it really encourages us to be in relationship constantly to do anything. And so, um, you know, Adrienne Marie Brown, um, one of her teachings is to move at the speed of trust. And I really, I think that fits so well with what we've all said and that, um, particularly in my day-to-day and -day scaling and providing strategic management um, for a growing initiative, there is this sense of urgency that we have to grow, we have to get bigger, bigger is better. And I think for me, my social work training has really provided this grounding point of making sure that everyone comes along and that that growth is steady and it's intentional and it's really rooted in collective vision and that with every decision we make, we're actually strengthening um, the bonds between everyone. And I think that is an incredibly different approach. Um, and also it requires um, slowness, I think that really allows us to create something different than the root causes that have been named so far in this conversation. Yeah, I think it kind of goes back to that idea of like, we can't go into it to fix, we got to go into it to sit and to learn, right? And sit in the mess and, and understand before any change happens. In my work, we talk a lot of, I was talking about it today in a training, this dialectic between acceptance and change and change doesn't happen unless we accept uh, where we're at. Um, you know, when you were talking about trust, that thought was coming up to me too. And, you know, we don't have relationships without trust. We don't have relationships with other humans or with 
agencies or with um, policy makers, um, you know, systems that, and trust is such a barrier, I think, to people getting their needs met at times, you know, the trust has eroded. And so that becomes a challenge in, in having relationships. And I think so much of what we do as social workers at our core, whatever it is, is, is building trust to build relationship. And when I was in school, one of the big buzzwords I always heard was that we are agents of change. That was like part of the identity of a social worker. We're there to create change um, and to facilitate change. And something I think a lot about is that, you know, it's not the interventions that change people. It's not necessarily the policies that change people. It's relationships that change people. We change people's hearts and their minds when they have a relationship and they are able to like see how things can be different. And I, I think, again, that's one of those ways that that tool of relationship building is, is so key to our work and being able to facilitate the changes that we want to see in the world. Absolutely. Um, I have I want to say something about trust and then I have a question. I know we're pushing our time, but just give me the word when, when we got to end. I'd like to like try to steal five more minutes. Um, on the, I'm just thinking about kind of what's in my world right now as, as a state rep. And in terms of trust, our, our social safety net is, um, let me be a diplomat, like could, <laughs> could be better. <laughs> and, and one of the ways we see that so much right now that's been really pervasive across the whole state is our whole Illinois Department of Employment Security. And, and there's a reason for it. You know, we're in an economic and public health crisis and our state agencies have, have been gutted in recent years. And so they really don't have the capacity who, who predicted this. Um, but what it means on the ground is that we see it in our office all the time when people are eligible for unemployment and they, they access the system, there are hiccups and, and things go wrong and, and they don't know what their login password is to, to access their benefits, their benefits that, that they deserve, that they need because they lost their job because we are in an economic crisis they can't even get a call back from IDES. And, and then some people reach out to their state rep's office and we help them navigate. But I think about like, that is a part of our basic human safety net. And think about what that does for trust, for trust that, that we have services that can help when we need them, when somebody is in dire need and the, the offices aren't open, they have to use the phone and nobody calls them back. Like that really erodes people's trust. And it, I, I just based on human behavior, at some point people are gonna give up. So there's a lot of um, rebuilding of trust needed in just our basic social safety net. The question I wanted to ask both of you is a concept I want to know about the concept of peer support, like peers helping people that are very much like them, helping their peers. That's come up in my work over the years a little bit. Um, how, what, how, do, how has that come up in your work and, and how has it been a helpful concept or not that, that you lean on to help your clients get what they need. Yeah, I, I can jump in. I think the first thing that comes to mind is taking it back to that that trust issue. I think, um, you know, so many of our clients have some of the struggles that they do because they have had trust issues or they've been burned so many times, right? That it's hard to trust others, especially when trauma is involved. Trauma erodes trust like nothing else. Um, and one of the things that I've seen that's been that's really effective in building trust is the idea of peer support. When you meet someone that's had a similar experience to you and you've seen how they've gone through it um, and they have their own journey and the wisdom they've 
accumulated from that journey there there's there's this great um, metaphor we think of sometimes in therapy about like we're, we're both on different mountains right and i'm i may be at a different point in my mountain than yours but i can see where you're at at your mountain because i have a different vantage point and you can see where i'm at you know, and so we're not we're not in the same place. We're we're both fighting our own battles, but we each have a different perspective. And so maybe what I've learned climbing my mountain can help you as you're climbing yours. Um, but when your mountains are really similar, um, I think that's where peer support can be really valuable. I see. I think a little bit of that um, in in the work that that I do at Cred. You know, the one of the most valuable tools that we have to fight violence in communities are people in those communities that care about them like no one else because that is their home and they know the community and they know the ground and so a lot of the folks that um, I work with at Cred come from the very communities and a lot of times from the very lifestyle and difficulties that the folks that we serve came from. Um, and so there's a peer support element in that where there's an automatic trust because you get it in a way that maybe somebody else may not. Um, I think another thing I'll say about peer support is that, um, you know, I mentioned that I do a lot of training of non-clinical folks and clinical interventions. And I think something we're seeing a lot more, especially in the mental health field, is that you don't have to have a license or a master's degree to do a lot of the things that we do. You just need to get the right training and have the right support um, and infrastructure. And I think that's we're going to see a lot more of this model. It's sort of blowing up, I think, in, in the field already, but I think we're going to continue to see a, a continued growth of how do we train folks on the ground in the community who are leaders in the community who maybe don't have the specialized education, but they have that lived experience that is so invaluable that somebody at an academic institution, as much experience as they have, it's just not the same. Um, it's valuable, but it's just not the same. Um, and I, I think about that a lot, like, and that's part of what gives me humility going into my work. I'm never gonna know that lived experience of the folks that I'm working with and even the folks that I'm training. Um, so we can give them support and 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 tools, and they then have this amazing skill set that makes them so much more equipped to do so this really important work. I think we need to, this is where peer support is so important. We need to think more about that skill set of lived experience being just as important as the skill set of I have the license, I have the years of experience in the field, because it it's something that just can't be replicated. That's kind of what comes to mind for me. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so powerful. It's really a powerful tool. Yeah, I love this and um, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I uh, One of my, my mentors has this beautiful kind of psychotherapy model where um, because of how we've been taught either to embody our identity, so whether it's a race or a gender or even just our professional status, that often we're in a one up or one down relationship with someone that either we're in that kind of expert mode where I'm going to tell you and you're going to be compliant and you're going to, you know, do what I tell you, or we're in that kind of one down where we're looking and we're like, okay, well, I'll follow your lead, whatever you need. I mean, I will, I will trust you totally. And really what, um, healing is and what, um, the work of creating something new is, is being alongside. And I see peer support very much, um, as another articulation of that, that actually the more that we can see each other as peers and be alongside our own growth journeys, like with the mountain metaphor, right. That we each see that we are bringing something together and with program management, um, for me, that's constantly, you know, bringing a peer support approach means that I'm not dictating, but rather constantly listening and working alongside people so that I'm actually making decisions with um, and based upon collect a collective understanding and articulation of like what the issue is at hand. And this can be as small as thinking about like, what is our, the number of workshops that we can deliver in this next year with on a sustainable basis or um, 
it can be applied in terms of when we work with a client organization that really what we say in our workshops is that we're actually facilitators, not trainers, and that this is a workshop, not a training, because really you are guiding this journey as much as we are. And we're just here to offer another perspective and to ask you questions about things that you already know. A lot of different examples from my work, even my current work as a state rep were popping up as you were talking and I'll just share one real quick. And that is, um, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still thinking a lot about how we don't, we, cert, we're, we, we are so far from doing what we need to do for our young people and, and families with disabilities, developmental and intellectual. And a, a bill that I'm working on aims to really open up the post high school opportunities for our young people with disabilities. And I had a, a long meeting about that today. So that's why I'm thinking about it. But that the, the real impetus for me working on this specific issue came from my visits to Vaughn Occupational High School right here in Portage Park. And it wasn't just me popping in and meeting the principal. It was me spending an afternoon at, at an after school matters art program, getting a whole tour of the school, sitting with the local school council, which is a elected body consisting of parents and community members and some, some school staff and the principal and being in conversation with them and hearing about what are the barriers, especially when a young person leaves high school. And when I saw, how much excitement there was around these ideas of well what could we how would life change if there were more opportunities that that just like really lit me up and, and gave me the inspiration I needed to to move forward um, with these things and I I try really hard to um, even though on some level being an elected official has got this inherent weird power dynamic in it um, I try really hard to bring people into the process as much as I can and, and to experience things with constituents as, as equals because we are peers and we are equals. Um, so a lot of, lot of peer support in my world. We're at nine o'clock. We were supposed to go till 845. Um, does anyone wanna offer like 10 seconds to just to put out into the world for people that are interested in social work to give some guidance and advice before we close out? You know, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I think we, we didn't even get a chance to talk about it, but one of the things when we were planning this event that all three of us got excited about is the just vast opportunities um, and areas that people can work in with a social work degree that really social workers are in every Sort of every industry that you can imagine. Um, and I think one thing that I've always found is that most of the social workers I've ever met are so excited to talk to others about their experiences. So I think a piece of advice that I might give someone who um, is like even just thinking about, hey, is this something that I might be interested in is if you know uh, someone who works in the social work field, um, ask them to grab a coffee and just pick their brain. Um, Cause I think social workers are excited to talk about their work. Um, and, and you can learn a lot from that experience. I mean, like, again, we deal in relationships. So um, that's, that's the essence of, we want to build relationships with other people who want to do the same. Um, and I think there's a lot of really, really wonderful mentors out there. And that's what helps build great social workers too. Um, so, so yeah, don't be afraid to, to call someone up, even if you just know them in passing and say, can you tell me a little bit about your work? I, I had someone in one of the groups that I'm training right now, um, reach out to me lately and say, what kind of a degree do you need to facilitate, do the facilitation you do? And I was like, well, let's have coffee. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I think that's how, that's how we, we spread the word. Um, great advice. I'll just add that don't let the application limit you, that 
just because don't let the number of jobs or the kinds of jobs limit you, but rather like think about what the application and the frame or the actual like framework is. And that really, once you understand that, you can go anywhere with it. And it truly is for the betterment of the field that you really test how far it can go. Yeah, great point. My advice would be very similar to Kelly's. I'm, I, we can't be afraid to reach out and ask for somebody's time and, and being generous with one's time is a value I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, always ask, be persistent. And, and what I'll, I'll add to what you said, Kelly, is you can ask somebody, um, and people do this to me all the time, like, because I know lots of people in the field, um, I can I can kind of tell you somebody, I can hook you up with somebody to have coffee with. And I love doing that, especially in my role now. So if anyone out there is interested in, in the field, um, not only you know am I here to talk, but I can hook you up with somebody else who might work in early childhood or domestic violence or veteran social work. All right, well, social work month is just about over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda and Kelly, for joining for this kind of informal, cool conversation that we don't we don't have enough of these things. So appreciate your time and sharing your experience with everyone out there on the internet. Thank you, Lindsay, for hosting and, and just elevating this conversation, giving us a forum. Um, and I also just want to say thank you for the way that you model the values that um, social work is based on in the work that you do as a policymaker. We, I, I say a lot, we need more social workers as policymakers. And I think you set the example of what it should look like. So thank, thanks for that. My pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. All right. Bye everyone. Have a good rest of the week.